They wear one one. start off with Adam Niehoff, and he's going to give you a TED talk about ethics on trial. Right. So I want to ask yourself two questions. Um, these questions have been debated since the dawn of man, from the Greek philosophers to today. We're still talking about these uh, simple questions of what is good and evil. Uh, questions that might be so simple, but not with a very simple answer. So today, I'm going to put your ethics on trial. Uh, I want you to try to question yourself on where you fundamentally get your moral standard or your moral compass. You know, why I think what is good is good and why I think what is evil is evil. So in order to visualize, um, you know, what is like morality, uh, here's a simple definition. So it's the principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior. But what is good and bad? What is right and wrong? Well, if we want to visualize good and evil, I think we can visualize it um, with just two people. Here we have Mother Teresa, uh, one of the, uh, the most influential people of the 20th century. She was known for her good deeds, saving the poor and needy, the refugees of war, uh, saving the lives of thousands of innocent people, women and children uh, especially, who were um, reduced to, the, to um, refugees by war. And she dedicated her life to building missions to save these people. Uh, so we can, you today, I guess we can label her as a good moral person, if we're honest with ourselves. And then here we have the opposite. We here have Joseph Mengele, known as the angel of death. Uh, he was responsible for the deaths of thousands of children in the Nazi concentration camps. Uh, he was known for experimenting on twins, uh, killing over 6,000 or 3,000 twins during his uh, time at Auschwitz. So if you look at these two people, they're polar opposites on the moral standard. We have here Mother Teresa, who is renowned as such a figure of, of goodness. And then we have here a purely evil man who fundamentally destroyed the lives of thousands of people. So if we're honest with ourselves today, we can label Mother Teresa as good and Mangala as evil. But why do we know that she is good and he is evil? What gives us that belief? Well, there, I guess, are two um, like standards of morality. We have an objective and a subjective standard. Objectively thinking is like just based on like logic and truth and fact and subjective, which we all have here is our own personal feelings. So today I want to try to think in an objective standpoint, try to think um, outside of your moral compass, try to question your morality. So I guess like, you know, when you talk about morality, you want to say, okay, where, where do morals come from? Well, I think morals, some people say, well, society determines morals. Uh, as a society, we determine what is right or wrong. Um, throughout, whether throughout the time period, we have improving as a society, well, you know, in some certain societies, like say in America, it's customary to have people over for dinner. It's a nice thing to have people over. You commune and dine with them, and you share good stories, and it's a polite thing to do. In other countries, in like tribal societies, in the Amazon, people will have you for dinner. Um, they are cannibals. Um, so there are two contrasting societies here. Some people are just having you over for a nice cup of tea or whatever. Some people are going to eat you. But well, what to society is right? According to the society of the, of the tribal people in Amazon, they are right. They, in their you know, cannibalism, they think that is, a, that is a good moral thing. However, we think that is an evil thing. But how can we have two contrasting societies and one moral truth? One other example is, say, you know, the United States and North Korea, two contrasting nations. You know, North Korea thinks America is an evil place. However, we think North Korea is an evil place. But how do we come to that conclusion that North Korea is an evil place the United States is an evil place. Obviously, they're killing people, which is an evil thing. And they're killing innocent people, but who is right? Which society is right? Because there's a contradiction between these two societies, I think this philosophical understanding is misleading. Well, maybe it's common sense. Well, it's just common sense what Mangala did was evil, which I agree with you. Uh, what he did, you know, killing children is a, was an evil thing. But his common sense told him that that was a right thing. He was trying to create a pure Aryan race during his time. It was common sense to him that what he was doing was right. So if it's common sense to him, but it's really common sense to you that that's evil, is it really common at all that that moral standard is a good or right thing? If it's common sense, well then, I guess you can adapt your morality to fit what you need. Um, you can think common sense is, um, you know, to Mother Teresa's common sense to help people, but the Mengele, it was to destroy people. So if it's common sense, there really is a contradictory belief between two 
um, again, with Mother Teresa and Joseph Mengele, there's two common senses, but there's two contrasting moral standards. So if you have two contrasting moral standards, again, philosophical misleading argument here. Well then, when maybe morals are evolving. As a human species, as we evolve through time, um, intellectually and physically, we are getting better as a society. I think I would tend to agree with you, but in the 20th century alone, uh, with the Holocaust and genocides of war, uh, there were more deaths in the 20th century alone than the previous 19 centuries combined. How can we say that we're improving as a society when there, the, the, the number of deaths, the number of genocides and famine and war and plague are just getting worse and worse? If we're evolving as a society, well then, right now, what we, what we believe right now could be morally wrong, because in 100 years, our morals could change, because they, they could evolve to be something different. Well, maybe, well, maybe instincts, uh, morals are instinctual. Maybe it's just an instinct in our brain that we see what Megala did was an evil thing and what Mother Teresa did was a good thing. Well, in, in, if instincts are just chemical reactions in our brain, are just simple brain activities, then how can we think or how can we produce logical moral truths? If Joseph Mengele instincts, he instincts, instinctually thought what he was doing was a good thing. Uh, there are some mental patients who who commit crimes, who, who kill people, but they think what they're doing is good because it's inside their brain. They think, you know, what am I, what I'm doing is, is a good thing. But if it's instinctual, well then, simple, like, what, how can we produce logical moral truths, which is random uh, brain activities, random chemical reactions occurring in our brain? How can we come to a logical conclusion that something is good or evil if, if everything, if everyone has different random brain activities? Uh, maybe, well, maybe morals, I determine my own morals. Uh, morals are self-determined here. But I guess this goes back to common sense of a society type of thing, because everyone has different morals. And there's so, such contrasting and different morals that we really can't come to a solid conclusion of what is true. You know, what, is, what was true for Mangala was to kill people and to experiment on children in order to produce a pure Aryan race. That was morally good and morally acceptable to him. But obviously to us here, we would think that was morally unacceptable. But you see, there's two contrasting moral views that who is right. That is the question here. Who is right? Who is fundamentally right? Well, then, technically, he was right in his own view, in his own viewpoint that we believe morals are self-determined. Well, maybe if you come to the conclusion, well, it's just whatever works. Whatever works in the, in the instance, whatever works in the scenario, that can just be morally acceptable. Again, you know, morals can then change. I could change my morals from saying, well, at some point, you know, what Mangala did was right, and maybe at another point, what he was doing was wrong. Morals could change depending on the situation, and they really can't, you know, come to a conclusion of a logical moral truth. So if we're honest with ourselves here today, we're questioning of where our morals come from. We would, like, if you were to look at all the evidence and all, like, just the logical thinking here, we would have to say, well, these philosophical arguments aren't very true and valid. Um, you, may, you may still hold these truths, but, if you honestly understand that there is such contrasting views between different societies, different types of people, uh, different you know activities of our brains, different activities of our instincts, then you really can't get one true moral standard. But I think we have to come to the conclusion that there's something something must transcend morality. Something must transcend human intellect. Um, something must, um, I guess, determine what is good and evil. So it's for humans to carry out our lives. Um, I have one here from quote from C.S. Lewis, a famous philosopher of the 20th century. It says, a man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. How can you determine something is evil without having an idea of something perfectly good? You know, if I judge what Mengele did was wrong, well, what am I judging that from? Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, a famous German philosopher of the 19th century, uh, actually predicted the atrocities of the 20th century because he came to the conclusion that the morals are self-determined, the 20th century would be the bloodiest century in human history. And he was right. He predicted that in the 1880s. He said this quote, Does you have your way, I have my way. As for the right way, the correct way, and the only way, it does not exist. I think we come to the truth of what Nietzsche taught and if a self-determined moral view, then I think there is no right way because there's so many contradictions with morality. Uh, Peter Dostoevsky, famous Russian philosopher of the 18th or 19th century as well, wrote in his, in his novel, The Brothers Karamazov, uh, I'm paraphrasing this for now for the sake of the argument, is if there is no transcendental moral lawgiver, everything is permitted. If there's nothing that transcends morality, that transcends uh, human intellect, there's nothing that you know, is perfectly good that determines what is morally acceptable, well then what Mengele did was wrong. He gets away with it. Joseph Mengele, or what North Korea is doing, what ISIS is doing, they're getting away with it because what they think is right is right to them, but then we can't 
honestly say what they're doing is wrong because to them it is right. But Dostoevsky, his actual quote, he said, if there is no God, everything is permitted. Now some people believe in different moral lawgivers, uh, but Dostoevsky believed that there must have been something that was perfect in order to determine a morally true thing. Uh, C.S. Lewis, in his, larger, in his larger sense of that quote, says he was before believed in a societal moral law, he came to the conclusion that there must be something that transcends morality to determine what is right or wrong. So he came up with this conclusion, and with my closing thoughts, he says, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust, but how had I gotten this idea of just and unjust? Again, a man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? So C.S. Lewis saw the world as an evil and corrupt place, but where has he gotten that idea from? Where has he gotten that, that thought of, well, there is something unjust, without having an idea of something perfect that transcended his thought? I think to conclude, if we believe in a world where Nietzsche is right, where morality is just determined by morals, or society determines morality, well then Mengele, what Mengele did was right, and it's a very morbid place to live in, um, but obviously, you know, we don't live like that because we, uh, we think and we, we think what Mengele did was an evil thing and what Mother Teresa did was a good thing because there's something that transcends us that, it's that we believe in our hearts that there must be something that is evil about, you know, murdering children. And I would honestly, you know, admit that. We have to have an idea of something good and perfect that transcends human thought and that determines morality. So I want you guys, you know, I'm not trying to like convert you to anything, but kind of rethink of what, you know, try to question yourself and question, you know, why do I think what is good is good? Why do I think what is evil is evil? Is there something that, you know, I, I believe in one of those things, but really philosophically is kind of contradicting to other people. Uh, so I'd maybe just re uh, kind of question your beliefs today, and that's kind of just what I here I am to do for. So uh, thank you. Good job, Adam. Good job. All right. So that was Adam with Ethics on Trial. So can anyone tell me why elephants have trunks? Because they look silly with both compartments. All right. Next, we're going to have Ember with Joan. But it looks like she's working on her PowerPoint. So, uh, what did the zero say to the eight? <laughs> nice belt. Nice belt. <laughs> <laughs> Just loyal, I got to crack out of that one. All right. <laughs> Why did giraffes have such long necks? Because their feet smell. <laughs> Joan and I, and I'd like to start out by saying happy birthday. Today is my grandma's 78th birthday, and I'm just so happy. So let's all just say happy birthday because I'm going to make her watch my TED Talk. So ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday! She'll be so happy. So I have had a best friend for 18 years, and it's her right here. Um, my grandma and I grew up together, and I was so fortunate enough to spend every day of my life with her. Um, so this is my grandma and I. She has taught me so much in my short 18 years here because she's had that extra 60 on me, so I guess that's okay. Um, but she is so kind and wise and gentle, and I think there's a lot to learn from our grandparents or from our elders. Maybe to start living like them before we are 60, before we are 70, before we're 90. So um, my TED Talk today is on my grandma Joan because she is just so very important to me. Um, this is us outside my garden around the age of three or four. Um, there's other pictures in the photo album where I'm holding dirty carrots over my head. I'm really happy that we just picked them, but I uh, figured this was a cuter picture. 
Um, I still have a garden and so does my grandma. I still love going to her house and helping her pick the carrots. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, every winter is really important to my family because everyone comes home from college now or everyone would just go to my grandma's house. So this is us celebrating the winter solstice, which is the shortest or longest day of the year, depending on where you live. And we would build snowmen if there was snow, and if not, we'd be kind of sad. But uh, we used to go to our kitchen table and lay out peanut butter and birdseed and pine cones, and then you'd roll pine cones and birdseed and put peanut butter and you'd hang them on the trees. And you're also supposed to string popcorn, but all of us are really bad at it, so we used to eat the popcorn and get yelled at. Um, <laughs> And you're also supposed to string cranberries because the birds like them, but they're bad at that too, so we eat cranberries. Um, but Grandma was so patient, and she just loved that we were all there together. So that was what really made it special for us, was the fact that, that we were all there together. Um, we would also go inside then and have hot chocolate or tea and admire my grandma's tree. She has this box in her attic called Jesus Stuff, and it is all of her like sentimental special ornaments that go on the tree first. So when we decorate the tree, we put those on top, and the rest of them are just other beautiful ornaments that we've given her over the years. So she takes everything to heart and she's just such a kind spirit and Christmas embodies all of that. So this is a more recent picture of my grandma and I. Uh, this is sophomore year at my confirmation. Um, she is a very religious woman. I'm not as religious as her, but um, her faith is really important to her. So it was really important to her and I both to um, for me to get confirmed. So I did that for, for her. I have a note and other things. Um, so my grandma likes to send us cards and notes in the mail or drop them off at our door or put them in boxes and hope we find them. So this one says, and this was my cross for my confirmation about 60 years ago, God bless grandma. So I'm wearing it in this picture, um, but she is very, just very thoughtful. She'll just show up at our house with fruit or a book or just she'll just show up and we have tea together, but if there's not a knock on the door, you know grandma's just coming right on in, so it's, it's okay, we love it. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's um, the story behind that picture. Uh, and this is my grandma and I in her garden. She was absolutely floored that her sunflowers were taller than me, so we took a picture together. This is, this is her first and only selfie she's ever taken, so she's really happy. Uh, she and I had just gone to the Old, Old Clove Church in Sussex, and she remembers going to church there when she was little. So it was really special for us to be able to go together. Um, it's really awesome. We should go to that ceremony. It's just really pretty, and they have like all kinds of community stuff, so she loves it. Um, and in that picture, I'm wearing a single strand pearl that she gives all of her granddaughters for their 17th birthday. So Courtney, Aaron, Brittany, and I all have the same necklace. Um, I have the card. I don't have the card to give me for my birthday, but I also have the book. So, um, she likes to put special notes in all the books that she gives us. So I have like 50 or 60 just beautiful handwritten messages um, to me from my grandma. Ember, granddaughter, I am so proud of the beautiful spirit I see in you. You have enriched my life in ways that are hard to describe. Your love will always be in my heart and mine and yours. The bond we have is, the bond we have found is everlasting as the spirit. You are 17 today, a junior in high school. What, are, what your future might be. Every page in this book is especially for you. Keep it nearby and read pages as you need. I do love you very much, Grandma Joan. So she does a really great job of doing a better job than Hallmark, I think, writing cards and messages. So I'm just very thankful that um, she's such a good writer and she's such a good influence on my life. Uh, she is, she and I love to wander the garden center up by her house on Route 23. It's not called Zorro's, but there's a dog there that we like to feed biscuits, and his name is Zorro, so we used to call it. Um, we like to play this game where we check the tags on plants, but before we check the tag, you have to guess what kind of plant it is. Um, and I'm really bad at it, she's really good. So today is her birthday, as I had said, so my little brother and I are going to go up there after school and pick her out some snapdragons because they're her favorite, so I'm really excited to see her after school. Uh, this is the most recent picture I have with my grandma. It's at my cousin Brittany's wedding. Uh, we were boogieing to something she couldn't understand, but that's okay. Uh, we had an absolute blast at the wedding, and I'm just so thankful that I have her here with me today and always. I was on the phone with her, like I am most days, and I was kind of like really stressed out because AP testing was coming up. So I had 
got off the phone with her and was just still really stressed. So the next day he came home from school, there was a card in the mailbox for me. All right, so my grandma had picked up a really beautiful card. It says, wishing you sunshine, wishing you rainbows, wishing you well. You are stressed and I will be too, worrying for you. If you are sad, I want you to be glad. This next month will be a turning the pages to the beginning of a new chapter in your life. It is a time of excitement, pride, and anticipation. Yes, anxiety also. The decisions, the decisions. You never really like to make decisions. Begin each day with a, a deep breath and the Lord's Prayer. You will be fine. There will be stumbling blocks, but you will be okay. You will be happy. Lots of hugs, love, prayer, and pride. Grandma. So um, on my grandma's 78th birthday, I couldn't think of a better way to celebrate than to celebrate her. So happy birthday, Grandma. Great job, Amber. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> All right. So next we have Riley. But before Riley comes up, I'll tell you another joke. What do cows do on the weekend? They go to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Riley. Riley is, his TED Talk is on the emphasis we put on gender. I was like, oh, you got tall. Hi, everyone. So, as you can see, I have on my heels. And I want, you to, uh, I want to start off this speech by asking you guys a question on how that makes you feel. Does it make you feel uncomfortable? Were you embarrassed for me? Did you laugh? Or were you like, oh my god, he looks really good in those heels? <laughs> so, um, you might be confused on why I'm wearing them, but um, I'm trying to make the point that these are literally just shoes. And Ever since we were little, we um, have been taught that these are for girls. And so my talk today is about, or is asking you to question why we've been that way. So, plus I have socks on, so pretend that's not there. But um, when I was little, I used to love to play with girl toys. I had this obsession with hair. Like, if I ate a banana, I would take the banana peel and like, whip it around, or I'd put a towel on my head and pretend it was my own hair. But um, I felt really comfortable playing with these things, and um, I still love things like Pokemon and action figures, but um, I really had a fascination with feminine things, and um, my mom even got me a Cinderella Barbie when I was potty trained, so this idea that um, the difference between boy, boy toys and girl toys could even come from my mom because um, she was really accepting, but I remember as I got older, I used to, I felt more embarrassed that I wanted to play with these things. Um, I tried to hide it, and you know, um, if my sister had girl toys, I'd like sneak up to her room and try and play with them without anyone knowing. And this was hard for me because I didn't care about sports or um, football or anything like that. Um, so um, as I'm older now, I'm realizing that the most prevalent ideas of gender roles um, really happen when you're young. I think this foundation of um, what's masculine and feminine is really like drilled into your head at your earliest ages. And um, yeah, so my point today is not to try and say that there's no difference between the sexes because that's not true. There's biological differences that have been scientifically proven, but um, I'm trying to say that sex and gender isn't <laughs> isn't the same thing because um, yeah the so the World Health Organization says that sex refers to the biological and psychological characteristics that define men and women, and gender refers to the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that a given society considers appropriate for men and women. So I think that really hits home on what I'm trying to say. Um, it's not really about me saying, oh, when I was little, I couldn't go to parties and be, you know, accepted. It's such a larger scale than that. I think if you think about this issue, it really can be traced back to a lot of the roots of issues in the world. I think that maybe women's oppression and men feeling the need to be hyper-masculine is really drawn back to this because when you're young, you're taught to be that way, and it's just 
embedded into your head. And um, yeah, so it really puts unnecessary pressures on both sexes. And I'm not asking you to go home and for Adam to put on a dress or <laughs> just an example, but um, I'm, <laughs> I'm asking you to think about um, next time you say, you know, man up or pink is for girls, that you try and realize that what you're saying is a lot more helpful than you think. So thank you. <laughs> Great job, everyone. Great job, Riley. Let's give Riley another round of applause. When he first walked up, I was like, could he really be that tall? I didn't know he was wearing his heels. And I was like, last time I remember, he wasn't this tall. All right, so that's a wrap up. Great job, everyone. And uh, what? We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>